From the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Tens of thousands of people are on the streets of London to protest against U.S. President Donald Trump's first official visit to Britain. More than 64,000 people are expected to march in the capital, and more than, other, than 20 other cities across the country were expected to join the massive protests during his visit. They carried placards that read, Dump Trump, and Keep Your Tiny Hands Off Women's Rights, while others chanted, Donald Trump has got to go. A giant blimp representing Trump in diapers has been drawing a lot of attention. And our correspondent in London, Pablo Navarrete, has been closely following these protests, so let's go to him. Here in central London, hundreds of thousands of protesters are expected to march against the visit by US President Donald Trump to Britain. Donald Trump arrived on Thursday and was met immediately with a protest outside the US ambassador's residence. Today in central London, a march, a mass march against Trump has just begun in what organizers expect uh, to have around half a million protesters. Uh, this will be the largest march in the United Kingdom since the march in 2002 against the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Trump has already um, caused controversy by criticizing Theresa May's Brexit policy in an exclusive interview with the British tabloid The Sun. Yet yesterday, um, they were pictured hand in hand at an event with the Prime Minister. So Trump's stay will be, as you can see, um, full of controversy and protest. Even though Trump has said he is popular in Britain, uh, a recent YouGov poll that was published on Thursday says that 77% of British people disapprove of Trump, with 74% calling him a sexist and 64% calling him racist. Thank you, Pablo, for that report. We're now joined live on the phone from the protest by Assad Rehman. He's a spokesperson for the Stop Trump Coalition. Hello, Assad. Thanks for joining us. Hello. So just describe first the scene there today. What has the moon been at the protest, Assad? Sorry, I got you. It's so noisy here. We have about a quarter of a million people out on the streets protesting Donald Trump and his policies and the politics he represents. So, Assad, your, um, Donald Trump has attacked Prime Minister Theresa May and the London Mayor Sadiq Khan, accusing him of welcoming migrants. What would your response be as a Londoner? Well, Donald Trump represents the politics of bigotry and hatred, of walls and fences. He tries to normalize racism and he gives support to the white supremacists. What we need now is a world where equality and justice. And in that, we say in London, we're a diverse city. We say refugees are welcome. We say migrants are welcome. But more importantly, we also say we have a responsibility of both our government and the American government to tackle why people are becoming migrants, the inequality, the injustice of an economic system that leaves the majority of the world poor while the rich get richer, the wars and conflicts that we arm and sell to dictatorships. We have to stop that, and we must stand in solidarity with all those people who want a dignified life. Now, Asad, I am looking at massive picture, pictures of massive crowds there in London. Are you surprised at the turnout? What are people actually expecting to, uh, to achieve with this massive show of force? We, we did want to send, and we knew we were going to send a very powerful signal. We knew that the people of Britain overwhelmingly rejected Donald Trump and the policies he represented. There are more people here than are at his inauguration. This sends a signal to Donald Trump that he's not welcome here and neither is, are his politics. So tell us more about the different protests planned around the country and what can we expect at those protests? Well, there were 50 protests today. There will be a huge demonstration in Scotland. These protests are about, are taking place all over. They represent people from all walks of life from all kinds of different... We've had toddlers against Trump. We've had uh, human rights organizations, environmental organizations, solidarity organizations, the Latin American community is out here in force. We are all united to say we stand for diversity. We stand for a different kind of society and a different world than Donald Trump represents. 
I said, um, see, I've read a report that said that um, Trump felt unwelcome by the Trump balloon. How does that make you feel? Sorry, I can't hear you there. The Trump balloon, the huge Trump baby balloon with him in diapers, he said it made him feel unwelcome. How does that make you feel? Yes. Well, Donald Trump is a man who uses his authority to punch down and belittle vulnerable people, those people without power. We know he's a thin-skinned narcissist. So this is a very fitting response. We know that this will, this is a sense of signal. It's a very British response to a man who is pompous, who is full of himself, and likes to massage his own ego. So it's an incredible, and it was an amazing event that we saw today. Thank you so much for I'm chatting sorry, with so us, Asa. Sorry, it's here. Yeah, yeah. sorry, it's so noisy here. I hardly hear you. <laughs> That's okay. Asad, we're enjoying your very British response. Congratulations on your protest. Thank you so much for talking to us. Earlier, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, said she wanted to deepen the cooperation between Britain and the United States following her meeting with Trump. May and Trump discussed security issues, including stopping nuclear proliferation. Trump has been talking about his great relationship with the British Prime Minister a day after he made a blistering attack on her plans for Brexit, saying they would kill trade relations between their countries. And to add insult to injury, he praised the recently resigned Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, saying he could be a great Prime Minister. No two countries do more together than ours to keep their people safe and prosperous. And we want to deepen that cooperation even further to meet the shared challenges we face now and in the years ahead. The relationship between our two nations is indispensable to the cause of liberty, justice, and peace. The United Kingdom and the United States are bound together by a common historic heritage, language, and heroes. The traditions of freedom, sovereignty, and the true rule of law were our shared gift to the world. They are now our priceless inheritance to a civilization. Now, Trump also took on London's mayor, City Khan, saying he's a terrible mayor who has done a very bad job on terrorism by allowing so many migrants to come into the city. Khan responded to Trump's comments. I'm not going to get involved in a ding-dong with President Trump about his views of uh, me. I don't think the rise in crime is because of immigration from North Africa or, or anywhere else. And that's for President Trump to explain why he thinks there's a link between immigration to Europe and the rise in crime in uh, our country and in other parts of Europe uh, as well. Now to Colombia, where 32 former FARC leaders will appear in front of the Special Jurisdiction for Peace Court, or JEP, late on Friday. The FARC members are accused of kidnapping. The first hearing will serve to provide the armed group members and their lawyers with the information that links them to the alleged illegal detentions so that they may decide whether to plead guilty or not guilty at a later hearing. The former leaders could face sentences of up to eight years if they plead guilty. But this could turn into a 20-year sentence if they plead not guilty and are convicted. And the former FARC leader, Pablo Catatumbo, spoke about the lead legal process that he will face on Twitter. He said the demobilized group, which is now a political party, is committed to the truth and to the victims of the conflict. And he added that national reconciliation can only be achieved if the people who participated in the conflict accept their responsibility. So now we go to our correspondent in Bogota, Jose Manuel Jimenez, for the details. At least 32 former members of the FARC armed group will appear before the Special Jurisdiction for Peace. Among those slated to appear are Rodrigo Lodonio, Ivan Marquez, Pastor Alape, Pablo Catatumbo, Carlos Antonio Lozada, Jesus Santrich, Rodrigo Granda, Joaquin Gomez, and Fabian Ramirez, among others. The accused can appear in person or send their lawyers instead. They can also appear virtually. This will be a historic audience as it's the first time that the former FARC members will come forward and tell their side of the story about the armed conflict. The former FARC members have received documents outlining the investigations of the prosecutor's office that will be used as the basis of the case against them. During the session, the accused can take a plea of guilty or not guilty, as the law dictates. 
To reiterate, this is a historic moment as the JEP has convened the highest representatives of the FARC, and they, for their part, continue to follow the peace accords and will show their face to both the country and the international community. Opposition members marched in Nicaragua to protest the government of Daniel Ortega before a general strike that starts on Friday. Demonstrators wave the national flag as they ask for the end of violence and for peace to be restored in the country. The opposition led by the Civic Alliance for Justice and Democracy will also take to the streets on Friday, a march that is expected to cover five kilometers from the east to the southwest of the capital city, Managua. Ortega's government has also announced its own demonstration for the same day from Managua to the city of Masaya to remember the 1979 Sandinista revolution. So now let's hear from our correspondent in Managua, Maria Jose Diaz, who has the latest. This Friday, police confirmed that four officers were killed in Morrito in the department of Rio San Juan. Nine people were kidnapped and taken to the area where the opposition holds street blockades at Empalme de Lobago. This happened as the violent groups held a march and attacked officials in the area. A teacher was hurt. The opposition has called for a 24-hour general strike across the country. Meanwhile, the Sandinista Front is expected to hold a ceremony to remember the heroes of Nicaragua in support of a country of peace and love, as Vice President Rosario Murillo called it. We thank Maria Jose Diaz for that update, and we take a short break now. So join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. I think it's fine. I mean, I think they like me a lot in the UK. Welcome back. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will meet with the Mexican president-elect Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador on Friday, hoping to make early strides on divisive issues like immigration, trade, and security. Pompeo will lead a high-level delegation made up of Jared Kushner, the senior advisor and son-in-law to U.S. President Donald Trump, Secretary of Homeland Security Christian Nielsen, and Treasury Secretary Stephen Mc. Mnuchin. The delegation will also meet with Mexico's current president, Enrique Peña Nieto, and foreign minister, Luis Videgaray, to discuss the transition of power. The president has directed that the Department of The Inter-American Court of Human Rights says Ecuador can't remove the asylum it granted to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. The report says that host states have the obligation to adopt positive measures 
regarding evaluation of the risk, such as the opportunity of a personal interview, and asked the state to arbitrate all the necessary means to protect persons in the event of a real risk to their life, integrity, liberty, or security if they were sent back. Lennon Moreno is expected to visit the UK in July 22nd following comments he made that his government had inherited Assange's asylum and would work to solve his situation. And remaining with news of Ecuador, President Lenin Moreno wants UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations, to return its building to the Ecuadorian government. Critics see this move as an attempt to destroy regional integration. Ecuador's President Lenin Moreno asked to the Union of South American Nations to hand over the regional headquarters building. Located north of Quito, Moreno expressed that he isn't opposed to integration, but is absurd that a building that costs millions of dollars has no usefulness. While the building is on Ecuadorian territory, that does not mean that it doesn't belong to an international body. The building belongs to UNASUR, and Moreno needs the approval of all the member countries to use that building, and as long as that doesn't happen, he would only be attacking the institution. Current Ecuador's president also proposed to use this space for a new intercultural university of nationalities. Moreno's decision has been prized by the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador as a way to restore the culture and language of indigenous people, but other organizations have rejected the announcement. By handing this building over to the indigenous movement, Moreno is destroying an integration tool of UNASUR and he's making the indigenous movement a part of the United States geopolitical strategy. One of the main goals of UNASUR was to strengthen the participation of the region in the international arena and preserve democratic continuity in Latin America. This regional economic and political project was championed by former Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez and former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa, leaders who sought to strike a power balance by working towards a multipolar world. UNASUR was created over the last decade as a tool for our survival in a globalized world, which has always hindered our growth and our development. Earlier this year, six countries suspended their UNASUR membership, including Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Paraguay, and Peru. They argued that significant differences exist between member states, and right-wing leaders have proposed the Organization of American States as an alternative voices of disintegration that would prefer to meet in Washington. Denis Herrera, Telesur Quito, Ecuador. Bolivian President Evo Morales met with Paraguay's president-elect Mario Abdo Benitez in La Paz. The leaders aim to strengthen cooperation and to help enhance the economies of the two countries. Evo Morales highlighted the importance of continuing to promote the development of the region. Morales and Benitez also addressed regional integration. Our Laura Prada has more on Prime Minister Gun Ralph Gonzalez's plans while he's in Cuba. Hello, yes, nice to greet you from Havana. Right now we are at Jose Manuel monument here at the Revolution Square where everything is getting ready for the beginning of the official ceremony of uh, welcoming to the Prime Minister of San Vincent and the Grandlings, Ralph Gonzalez, who is uh, performing a visit to the island. And he'll be received by Cuba's President Miguel Diaz Canel afterwards. He is also invited to participate at the Sao Paulo Forum here in Havana that will begin this Sunday. We'll be here uh, to share with our um, friends, our viewers from all over the world, what comes from this visit. Thank Laura Prada for that report. In Mexico, a newborn hippo has become the latest sensation at a zoo in the northern city of Guadalajara. Beto, as the hippo is called, was born last May, but it's only now that the 56 kilo animal is being shown to visitors. At just six weeks of age, the hippotamus remains constantly at the side of his mother, Gina, who was also born at the zoo. Beto is a restless baby and tries to move through the water, though always under the supervision of his mother. He's a cutie. We're going to take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. At least 70 people have been killed in a bomb attack on an election rally in Pakistan. Over 100 others have been injured. The victims were taken to a hospital in Quetta. The attack was against a campaign event by the Awami National Party, which is a center-left and secular organization in Balochistan province. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility. Earlier, Another blast killed four people in Banu in the northwest of the country. General elections are set for July 21st, and the political campaign has been one of the deadliest in the country's history. Okay, so we're being joined live now by Assad Hashmin, an Islamabad-based Pakistani journalist. Hello, Assad. Are you hearing me? Hi there. Yes, I can. Okay, lovely. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Thank you for being here. Please explain to us who was targeted in this attack and why. Well, so this uh, suicide attack seems to have targeted a Balochistan Awami Party rally. Now, this is uh, the BAP party, is a brand new party that was launched just a few months ago. Uh, now, its a candidate in that area is a young man named Siraj Raisani, who is a political leader from the area. He has he is the uh, he is the brother of the local tribal chieftain and quite an influential personality in the in the region. Uh, it's not entirely clear why exactly this rally has been targeted, but we have been expecting as the election campaigns have really been kicking into gear, as we have only about two weeks left to go for the election, that there would be an uptick in attacks. Now, the attack that has taken place today, obviously, is one of the deadliest that we have ever seen at an election rally in Pakistan. Uh, current reports indicate that the death toll could be as high as 85, if not more. Uh, those reports are still coming in as the bodies are still being counted and transferred to Quetta Civil Hospital. Now, Asad, tell me, how does this fit into the election campaign and what kind of impact will it have? Well, I think, as I said, we're just beginning to kick off uh, the campaign in earnest, and you're beginning to see sort of daily rallies from all of the major political parties. And I think this will definitely uh, give them pause to have to stop and think and rethink their security arrangements, perhaps. Not just this attack, but the attack in Bannu earlier today as well. That killed four people. And there was an attack just a few days ago in Peshawar that killed a candidate and killed 20 others as well. Uh, that was targeting an ENP political rally. So I think all political players now will have to rethink their strategy perhaps and definitely try to beef up security we might see uh, some rallies cancelled as a result of this uh, it's definitely something that we don't want to see uh, but unfortunately it seems like we're going into another violent campaign in Pakistan Asad thank you so much for your report stay safe we'll be chatting with you throughout the election campaign thank you so much for joining us now, outrage is spreading in Spain after a series of audios have been released linking the former king Juan Carlos to alleged corruption. In the recordings, the former king's lover, Corina, is heard explaining how Juan Carlos wanted her to be his front person for a series of properties. She also says Juan Carlos used to get commissions for Spanish business done abroad, including the construction of a high-speed train by Spanish companies in Saudi Arabia. In one of the recordings, Karina also says the former king was involved in the business of his son-in-law, who's currently serving a jail sentence for corruption. 
In Malaysia, a young girl has become a star thanks to her slick freestyle football moves. This in a country where the sport is normally dominated by men, 18-year-old Kwarishna Endag Wayu proves Islam does not limit women from playing sports. She trains five days a week and her moves have earned her 72,000 Instagram followers on her account so far. She is positive that freestyling is aimed to gain more interest among Malaysian women. She's really good. A mega radio telescope project will, which will produce high definition images of the Milky Way galaxy has been inaugurated in the South African town of Carnarvon. The project is called Mekat and presently consists of 64 giant dishes to scan the universe. The cost to build the satellite dishes was over 300 million US dollars. The project is still under construction and will become fully operational by 2020, once it's complete, it will be the world's biggest and most powerful radio telescope. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesyourtv.net forward slash English. You should also join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching. Our programming from Monday to Friday where you'll find the best information on innovation.